Hello, everybody. This is Robert Barton at North Carolina State University. We're going to kick off today's webinar. Our host today is Debbie Roos, who is a county extension agent out of Chatham County. Debbie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Bob. I want to welcome everybody to the May 13th virtual force for North Carolina series on protecting your woods. This is the second in the protecting your wood series. And today's topic is going to be on non timber forest products and agritourism. Thank you for taking part of your day to join us. If you've joined us before, we want to welcome you back. And if this is the first time, we're really happy to see y'all here. My name is Debbie Roos, and I am a sustainable agriculture agent with the Chatham County Center of North Carolina Cooperative Extension. I'm on the workshop planning committee, and I'll be your moderator today. We love to communicate here at Forest Her. So if you want to type in the chat box where you're from, uh, where you're you know, participating from today, we'd love to see that. Um, and so with that, um, I'm going to hand it back over to, to Bob to uh, talk about um, how to communicate. It's going to walk us through the options and some of the housekeeping for Zoom. Thank you, Debbie. As Debbie indicated, let me just touch on a couple of the logistics related to Zoom. So uh, your participation in today's webinar will be uh, enjoyable and uh, hopefully less frustrating with technology. So a couple things. If you have uh, questions today, we ask that you enter those in uh, using the Q&A feature of Zoom. You'll see there's a little icon at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can click on that, and we ask that you enter your questions in there. Uh, if you are running into technical issues or don't have a question but want to give us some feedback or something, we ask that you use the chat for that. As many of you have already demonstrated, you're quite capable in chatting. And I know for many of you, you've done this before. So what I'm saying is probably in some ways a repeat of what you heard in the past. We are recording today's session and that recording will be available later on YouTube. And at the end of today's webinar, there'll be a link for you to click on in the chat that will take you to the survey for the today's webinar. And we'd ask for you to complete that so we can get your feedback. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Debbie. Okay. Thanks, Bob. I'm kind of chuckling because speaking of technical issues, my PowerPoint slide was not advancing. so. That's why you saw me frantically exiting and coming back in. We're about to find out. There it goes. Now it's working. Thank goodness. Um, but hopefully now, thanks to Bob's um, intro there, you're comfortable knowing where to put your questions. And again, put your uh, where you're from in the chat. Um, so with that, um, you can see our agenda here. We've got three excellent speakers today. And um, we're going to have what we're going to do at the end of each speaker's talk, we're going to preserve a few minutes for Q&A. And then also at the end at 2.30, when the webinar ends, we have the option of y'all sticking around for another half an hour for uh, additional questions for our speakers. They will also be there that last half an hour from 2.30 to 3. And or if you have any other topic related to, to forestry, we'd be happy to hear from you there. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, introduction to forest farming botanicals. We're going to look at pine straw as revenue and then also talk about agritourism. And I can see we're already a little ahead of schedule. That's good. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and ask our first speaker, uh, Dr. Janine Davis with North Carolina State University to go ahead and share her presentation. And she, I'm really excited to hear her talk. This is um, a topic near and dear to her heart. She's going to give us an introduction to forest farming botanicals. Take it away, Janine. Will do. Thank you, Debbie. And uh, yes, I'm Janine Davis, and I'm coming to you from just south of Asheville in Western North Carolina. And this is a very special topic to me. I've been working with these forest botanicals now for 30 plus years, so I really love them. Um, so just let me get that top screen part to disappear. The botanicals I'm going to talk to you about today are all perennial herbs. So this is not something you're going to plant today and harvest, you know, within the year. 
They usually need to grow for three or more years before you can harvest. And I still say that roots are the primary plant part of interest. So you do a destructive harvest, but more and more we're finding markets for and uses for the leaves, which is allowing us to start harvesting earlier and you know, just make this a more sustainable crop. And we're gonna focus all on native plants. So the first one is clearly our most popular one. That is ginseng, American ginseng. And very nice looking plant there on the left. And that's what we're seeing in our woods right now. Now, this is a plant that is really best suited for Western uh, North Carolina, for the Appalachian Mountain Range. You could probably grow a few plants for yourself if you live in the Piedmont, but doing this on a commercial production scale is very, very difficult in North Carolina in the Piedmont. We've had a little bit more success in Virginia. So we consider this one a mountain plant. It is propagated almost exclusively by seeds. And the major market for ginseng is still in Asia. Uh, it goes through Hong Kong, although more and more um, Europeans and North Americans are starting to use this plant. I'm excited now to be able to put that ginseng leaves have a good market. They go into teas and now into tinctures. And the price of ginseng is quite volatile, volatile changes every year. But you're looking at $350 to $800 or more a pound dried. Golden seal is probably the second most popular plant in very high demand. And as of May 1st, it is once again an endangered species in North Carolina. So there's new rules and regulations on being able to grow and sell this plant. Um, I will be writing up a piece on that shortly and I will show you my website where you'll be able to find that. This plant also grows best in Western North Carolina, but it will grow in the Piedmont if you've got kind of a cool, moist site, usually a Northern slope. And this one is propagated by seeds, but mostly by cutting those rhizomes that you see there on the bottom. And the roots are bringing $25 to $50 a pound dry. And we have an ever-growing market for the tops of those plants that this spring are bringing up to $9 a pound dry. This is bloodroot, which is a very versatile plant, also in high demand. It is used as a dye plant. It's used uh, for its antimicrobial and anti-cancer claimed properties. It's used in an appetite stimulant in cattle feed. It's also a very beautiful plant and is often sold as individual plants for people to use as a landscape plant within their woods. And this plant is bringing five to $10 a pound dry. And our final plant that we'll focus on today, and really this list, I could do this for 100 plants easy, but I'm kind of giving you the top ones. This is black cohosh, again, another very beautiful landscape plant in very high demand. Uh, many people are still wild harvesting this, but we're encouraging people to forest farm it. And it is selling for about $6 a pound dried right now. So if you want to forest farm botanicals, site selection is the most important factor. These plants I've just discussed all need about 75% shade, and this can be done in a mixed hardwood forest. Some pines are okay, but just this week, one of my employees was standing in a beautiful all pine ginseng um, planting. So, you know, there, there are exceptions, but we usually say a mixed forest. You want to look for appropriate companion plants. You want to have good airflow and good water drainage because some of these are very prone to fungal diseases if you don't provide that. And these should all have soil that stays moist year round. So we usually are looking on the more northern slopes. And there's two basic production methods. One is known as woods grown or woods cultivated where you're building beds you're um, incorporating fertilizers, you're using a bed shaper, you're sowing seeds using like a push seeder and covering it oftentimes with straw like you see on the left. 
but most of our growers are going with what we call a wild simulated method, which is trying to do it as natural as possible. You basically rake aside the leaf litter, loosen up that soil a little bit with a rake. You might sprinkle on some gypsum if it's needed, like for, for ginseng, most of us do that. You scatter your seed lightly, and then you cover it over with your leaves and maybe some light branches to keep those leaves from blowing. You use a much lower plant density in the wild simulated method than you do in the woods grown method. This is a really important point that's obtaining high quality seed and planting stock. And I'm just showing some companies on the right there that I've done business with for decades, that I have a lot of faith in them, but there's many, many more. Positive species identification is critical. And some of these plants like the cohoshes, even the experts would have difficulty telling them apart from just getting the seeds or the roots. So know who you're buying from, make sure they've got a good reputation for medicinal plants. And if you dig plants yourself, make sure that you're doing it legally and sustainably. When you have your plants in the ground, um, you know, they don't need as much care as like growing vegetables or something, but you do have to visit the sites regularly. You have to watch for voles can be very devastating. In some areas, deer browse can be a problem. With ginseng, we're watching closely for diseases like phytophthora and blight. And then just watch for if a tree falls. Um, oftentimes then you might get erosion from that opening in the canopy that, that is then there. And in the case of some of these plants, ginseng in particular and golden seal to a lesser extent, you've got to protect from theft. So if you grow ginseng, you're going to be investing in cameras. When we get to harvest, this is something you're going to want to plan way ahead for. And you're going to want to do this very clean. You're going to want to protect the integrity of these plants. You're going to want a dryer. So you know this is something that, that we could do a whole workshop on the post-harvest part. And then plan way ahead for how you're going to sell this. Are you doing wholesale, retail, making your own products? Are you going to do this with an agritourism venture? There's many options, but this has to be done ahead of time. And this is a business. How much money do you expect to make? Do you want to make? I know people that make from a couple hundred dollars. Most people are making you know, a couple thousand to $10,000, but then some people are supporting their whole family on forest farming. So understand your customer base, who you're gonna sell for, do that business plan and do an annual review. Here are some books that I strongly suggest you look at um, that'll cover all aspects of growing and the business aspects of it, like the book there by Richard Wiswall. And here is a website that you just have to check out, the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition, which is a big multi-state project. And we have lots of great videos to watch on this. This is an ongoing project. And then here's my own website. And this is where we'll post information on, for example, you see that there's a forest farming field day in West Virginia um, in just a few days. And this is where I'll post the Golden Seal information. So how'd I do time-wise there, Debbie? Oh, you did great. We've got plenty of, plenty of time for questions. Good. Um, so let me, let me remind y'all to put your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat. That'll just make it easier for me to find them. Um, so our, our first question, Janine, and actually let me also encourage people to really check out uh, Janine's website. She's got a ton of excellent information on there. Um, so our first question is, are there any native botanicals that can be grown in the coastal plain for sale? That is an excellent question. And I don't really have them. Um, I'd say for years now, I have been trying to find out what botanicals really grow in our coastal region, because you know people are using them. But I'm not hearing about it for in the forest. So occasionally we will try to grow some of our better known botanicals 
over on the coast and some will do okay. You know, we, we can do some black cohosh and sometimes some bloodroot. We've not had any success with ginseng or golden seal, but that's something personally I'd like to learn more about. Good question. Okay, and uh, someone had asked about, do you have any recommendations for vol control? Vol control is really difficult and they're so unpredictable. You can go 10 years without ever having one and they're there. And this is a big part of our discussions um, in our forums. A lot of people use cats. Uh, that is one of the most environmentally friendly ways to do it. There are baits that you can use, but we use them with great caution um, because you know, you're out here in the woods and we don't want to also poison our wildlife. We've got some people experimenting with some pretty innovative traps, but uh, we don't have a firm answer for, for the voles. Okay, and next question, how long does it take to grow ginseng? Good question. So if you grow ginseng in that woods cultivated method where you have pretty intensive production and raised beds and fertility, you can often pull off a crop in five to seven years. If you're doing the wild simulated method where you're trying to make those roots look as wild as possible, which is gonna greatly increase their value, you will have fewer roots, but each root will be whole lot more. That can take 10 to 15 years or longer. So we have a lot of people that plant their ginseng saying this is going to be my child's college fund planted right out there. So we didn't get into all that um, information about ginseng and how its appearance affects the value. But that's the difference between wild and cultivated ginseng is, is how it looks. Okay. Are there specific workshops or trainings you would recommend for someone who's just starting to think about this and would like to le learn more in a more hands-on way? Definitely. So go to the Appalachian Beginning Forest Farmer Coalition. That is a real great place to start. We're have, having workshops all over this region. Plus, we will often put events on there that aren't ours, aren't part of the coalition, but we think are good for, for local people, um, you know, within your own region. More and more of our county agents are putting on forest farming workshops. And there are so many very talented growers out there who have taken this on as part of their, their business is they offer these workshops. And, you know, I'm happy to share the names and of the businesses that, that do a really good job at that. So they're all over the place now except on the coast. <laughs> Are there certain trees or bushes that ginseng prefer or do they like to grow in patches by themselves? I have approximately 10 acres and would like to narrow it down where I could target my search. So with all of these plants, you know, we do have recommendations. And if you look at my book, there is like this whole plan in there about look for this, that, and the other thing, and these kind of trees. And the, the plants haven't read the books though. So I often encourage people, if this is your first time doing this, and if you don't have ginseng, golden seal, or black cohosh growing on your property already, that you try different sites. They will grow under a lot of different hardwoods, but like I said, they're just outside of Asheville. They were growing in a pine, all pot, white pine forest. Um, Mostly you're looking for moisture, often a north facing slope. That's what I have found is almost more important than what kind of trees that they're growing under. Okay. I live close to the coast, wetlands and forest. If these have trouble growing naturally here, could large pots be an option? Read that one to me again, Debbie. Oh, could large plots be the option? Uh, pots. Growing pots. Pots. Yes, you can. If you can protect them from the heat. I actually know someone that grew a couple thousand ginseng plants in huge pots because he wasn't on the coast, but he just had terrible, terrible soil. So he created his own soil mix and he did that up until he passed, probably about 20 years. My concern on the coast is going to be the heat. 
ginseng does not thrive in that kind of heat but if you could provide shade even and you know maybe even a misting type system to help keep things cool um you know you might have a unique market for potted plants and he did his in the woods okay back to the voles <laughs> any luck using permatil for voles when planting I don't know. Good question. Boy, this is this is a hard group here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Not sure if this is applicable, but is mushroom farming productive in the coastal region? Yes. Yes, the mushrooms for sure. And there are other things you can grow besides the botanicals. So there are people doing some kinds of vegetables and berries. There's lots of other non-timber forest products besides just the botanicals and we do have a lot of mushroom growers in far eastern north carolina okay we're still doing great on time keep the questions coming um other than the ones you've mentioned are there additional woodland botanicals that are prof profitable that grow well in the piedmont in the piedmont um, I would look at things like the blue cohosh. Gosh, I should have my book right in front of me to, to cue me here. Um, Solomon seal. That's one I've got to start including in all of my presentations now because the demand for Solomon seal, particularly for pain, is at an all time high and we just don't have a lot of it. Um, some people are doing very well with fairy wand, also known as star grub root, that's camelirium. Um, there's so many of them. And I, I would also be looking at some of the greens, you know, doing things like miner's lettuce. There's, we could spend hours just talking about all of the different plants that there are markets for. Um, coming out of our woods. It's really a wealth, a real treasure chest. Okay, uh, my soil is clay based. Will they grow in that type of clay? She didn't say what she's referring to. I guess she meant all of the things the crops mm -hmm. are talking about. So you want good drainage. So if you've got a site that's clay, but it's also low, and when you get a good rainstorm, that water just stands there, that's not good for any of these plants. Um, but if you're on enough of a slope, we've done really well with high percentage clay soils without any problem. So it's, it's the drainage. You're going to want it to either be able to flow off or you know to percolate through pretty readily. Uh, ginseng in particular, you don't even want to risk it with ginseng. There is another plant um, called a yellow root which is sometimes confused with golden seal that does, it's one of the few that will grow in that moisture area, like right down by the stream where it can, it can repeatedly flood, but, but that's one of the few. Oh, others, trilliums too, uh, Beth root, um, little bit jack in the pulpit. Boy, there's a lot of different plants you can do. What makes Solomon seal valuable to grow? So Solomon seal is one that there has been always a little bit of a market for. Our herbalists all have it in their apothecary. But in the past decade, as we have tried to find alternatives to the opioids for pain control, any herbs that give pain relief are now being explored. And that's where Solomon seal fits in. And in some of our workshops, our herbalists will show you how to make a healing um, salve and a healing oil with Solomon seal root. I have eight new golden seal in my woods from Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. They're doing well, but is there anything I should look out for this summer? Um, golden seal, once it's established, usually does pretty well. It's one of the easier ones of our plants to grow. So there aren't many things that browse on it. I've not seen voles give us any problems with it. Um, if I were you, I'd wait until it sets, you know, gets the berries. I'd collect the berries and, you know, collect the seed and expand your patch with seeds. Okay, we got time for a few more. Are there any botanicals that grow well in swampy or low-lying areas in the coastal region? Yeah, I'm not a real coast expert, sorry to say. Um, 
with the botanicals, I don't know that many. When I think about the coasts and the, the people I talk to making money there, we're talking more like the Venus flytrap plants. But, you know, clearly we need to uh, have a session on this and bring some of our coastal experts in. <laughs> Sounds good. Where can we find out more information about existing markets for forest botanicals in our local areas? So when you're first starting out, my suggestion is always to look up who your herbalists are in that region and find out what they need and if they would be interested in buying for you. You're going to find that most of your herbalists order from a company called Mountain Rose Herbs in Oregon. And many of them would be very happy to buy from a local source. So try those kind of building those relationships first. And oftentimes those herbalists, they'll get all excited that you're growing that way. And they'll say, can I bring a class out? And you know, that is gonna get more into your agritourism that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and then go to your natural health food stores, any of your natural practitioners and see if they're interested in carrying some of your products also. And you might want to make some of your own products. That's another workshop we can hold are the rules and regulations of making value added products. And then, then we can do the wholesale basis. And we are very fortunate in North Carolina to have some of the leading buyers in the world located in North Carolina. But dealing on that wholesale level, you know, that's where you need lots of volume and you get the lowest price per pound. So we usually start out with our local markets first. All right, Janine, what is the market for Trillium? So there are several Trilliums. Bethroot, for one, is, is one that is um, not super high demand, but a constant demand. So if you're someone that can grow that Trillium very well, there's probably going to be a buyer that's going to come to you every year saying, you know, I want my four or five pounds of Trillium. Okay, so we, we still have several questions, but we are out of time. So this is why I'm going to, I'm hoping those of you who have not yet had your question answered can stick around between 2.30 and 3, because we will circle back to these. And again, a reminder, if you're putting your questions in the chat, please retype your question into the Q&A. That way they're all in one spot. So um, that was super fascinating, Janine. I don't know about y'all, but I'm really glad this is recorded because I'm already planning on going back to the recording to get all of these details. So thank you, Janine. I really appreciate that. And again, we'll, we'll uh, have Janine address the, the rest of the questions during the end of the webinar from 2.30 to 3. So thank you again. So with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Lisa Hartrick is from the North Carolina Forest Service and she's gonna be talking about uh, revenue from pine straw. Okay, hi. So um, as you heard, my name is Lisa Hartrick. I'm the Assistant Forest Supervisor at Bladen Lake State Forest. And that is located in the Southeastern Coastal Plains of North Carolina in Bladen County. Um, we have been asked to speak a little bit about pine straw as revenue because we uh, rate quite a lot of it here. So I'm just going to share with you a, kind of an overview of, of the things that we think about and kind of uh, what it takes to get it done. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for your patience, folks. Um, I just wanted to talk to you about if you own woodland, the ownership usually requires an income to fund uh, doing any kind of management on it, whether it's for wildlife or for timber uh, or for water quality improvements or soil uh, productivity preservation, or of course, for any taxes that are due, any loans to buy the property. And of course, if you enjoy just uh, recreation on your land. Um, there's uh, one type of pine tree that has an option of making some revenue without cutting it down. And that's a longleaf pine. Um, if you uh, have it, you might have an opportunity to generate non-timber revenue by selling the pine straw. Uh, who we are, like I said, it's Bladen Lake State Forest. This is an overview of uh, all the land that we own. We are north of the Cape Fear River and we are east of Fayetteville. Uh, we are a working demonstration forest, which means we try to have 
examples of different options that landowners could use uh, or to try out and whether they were successful or not. Uh, we are 100% receipt funded, which means we have to find money on the forest because uh, tax dollars do not contribute to anything here, not salary, not operational costs, uh, nothing. So um, we have targeted 2,100 acres to be managed for pine straw production. And uh, that would be out of our whole forest, which is 33,000 acres, of which uh, 6,000 acres are planted in longleaf. So as you can see, not all our longleaf is in pine straw production. Uh, what a stand of longleaf pine, you know, or for pine straw, what the stand needs to look like is longleaf pine is the preferred species. I've heard of uh, some loblolly being raked, but around here longleaf is, is the one. Uh, generally the stands are between 10 and 80 years old. They should be producing enough straw to be raking. Uh, you need to suppress the competition. Uh, that includes prescribed burning every now and then or chemical application. You need to reduce the debris that is across the stand, whether it's from storms, uh, limbs breaking out or bark blowing off. Um, everywhere. Uh, you need to have access into the stand. Uh, pretty much they are operating with pickup trucks and little sedans. So for access, you need to have woods roads that sedans with not four wheel drive can get through where they're trying to get to. And the pickup trucks are gonna be probably without uh, license plates on them, just driving around in there collecting stuff. Um, then of course the stand boundary itself needs to be clearly marked so that they don't break outside of the scope of the contract. So on our forest, what we have designated as straw stands are between 16 and 65 years old. We got about 64 stands and they are all different sizes and they're kind of a mosaic across the forest. Uh, we have three acres to 140 acres per stand. Um, generally, most of the, uh, the medium stand is about 26 acres. And of course, you want a little amount of sunlight on the ground so that um, competition doesn't grow up. So therefore, they're a little bit heavily stocked. And that would be with a basal area of 90 to 120 square feet per acre of wood. Uh, we have about 1,700 acres that we manage as straw. And then um, we have about 18 tracks that have been clear cut because we do have a, an age where we stop breaking the straw and we just cut the trees for the timber value. And that's usually about age 60 if it's in straw production. So we have uh, 18 tracks that are two to 15 years old, totaling about 300 acres that aren't ready to be raked yet, but they're getting there. Um, so a straw stand, this is just a, a picture of one. It's got a young longleaf pine in the front. And then to the uh, left, you're gonna see some vines. I believe that's Japanese honeysuckle. It might be Carolina jasmine. Uh, in the background, uh, there is some turkey oaks that are starting to re-sprout and come back up. Competition can interfere with the straw raking and it degrades the straw's value. No one wants hardwood leaves and uh, other debris all tangled up in their straw that's in their yard. Um, for us, we do have a waxy leaf uh, vegetation gallberry that can be a, a problem, but uh, with burning that usually keeps it in check. Vegetation such as dwarf huckleberry or blueberry or uh, wiregrass usually are not a problem around here. Uh, prescribed burning is a good tool to control any kind of encroachment. Uh, it helps to control the competition. It cleans the stand of all that debris that is, uh, always falls from the trees and it provides a burst of nutrients to the trees. And this is a prescribed burn in a longleaf stand and it was lit by uh, spots and just kind of uh, slow burning, just kind of uh, till the spots come together. How often do we sell our straw? Well, each year out of the 1700 acres that we have designated, we uh, select up to about 600 acres to put up for sale for straw. Uh, historically, we rake each stand every two years, usually, depending on you know, the condition of it, but we try to do every two years. Over time, competition does move in. Even when you're raking it, you're still gonna get encroachment of you know, volunteer hardwoods and shrubs and vines and 
grasses. So to clean up those stands, we're moving towards a three-year cycle where instead of um, rake, rest, rake, we're gonna rake, rest, burn, and then rake again. That way with the rest period, you're giving um, time for the fuels to burn, uh, to build up so that the burn actually does some good. Um, we usually, oh, did I skip one? So uh, when we decide we're putting pine straw up for sale, uh, our strategy is that we do two sales a year. They are usually in March and July. Uh, each sale is targeting about 300 acres. It usually is broken down into stands. If they're really small stands, we'll lump them together, but uh, you know, to try to make it maybe 17 acres total, something like that. But overall, we'll have eight to 10 contracts that total 300 acres. Uh, each one of the contracts will have a track map. Uh, it'll also give you the scope of work and you know the access and any other information that they would need for it. We mail the announcements out to all parties who has to be put on our mail list. And currently we have 18 interested parties who we mail out every time. Usually we have at least six who start submitting bids. Um, and usually we have at least four who are calling wanting to know when the next sale is. So it's quite, um, it's a good business. So each contract has a request for a sealed bid form. And that's where they put down how much they want to pay us for that one stand in that one contract. Uh, they are responsible to go and look at them, figure out how much volume is out there, you know, figure out what it's worth to them. Uh, we will show them the stands if they call and make an appointment with us. Otherwise, the maps, uh, they can kind of find them on their own if they choose to. And of course, the stands are all painted, so they should know where the boundaries are. Um, sealed bids uh, come in. Uh, we keep them here at the office until a designated time. And then we open them up, and each contract is awarded to the highest bidder. And it's pretty amazing the range that those bids are for one stand. Um, the purchaser will have uh, the sole right to the straw on the awarded sale area for a period of time of about six months. That's usually what our contracts are for us for six months. Um, uh, at the end of six months, we usually do give the vendor the option to extend for three more months. And we ask for 15% of the initial sale to cover that three months. Um, you should, you, it's 50-50 if they take the three month extension or not. Uh, this is just kind of an example of, of pieces of the bid sheet. Of course, it's gonna identify the contract at six months, what stand number it is, total number of acres. It's going to um, tell them they need to get it here by a certain day. They need to provide us with a tax ID number or a social security number. Um, Anybody can buy tracks. You know, it doesn't have to be somebody who's in business as a wholesaler. Um, and uh, when we award it to the highest bidder, we give them a call and they have 15 working days to do two things. They need to, well, three things. They need to come and sign the contract saying that they understand it and they agree to it. They need to give us a performance bond and they also need to give us at least 50% of what their bid was. Some of, some of our vendors, if they're large um, companies, they will give us 100% at one time and be done with it. And the reason why we allow two installments is we have some people who it's a, a small, it's, it's a couple of people who are trying to get started. And we don't want to make it difficult for them to compete by asking for uh, their bid amount up front 100%. So we'll get 50% from them and then we'll give them like two months to be raking to make a little money and then they would pay us for the remainder of it. Um, just uh, within the contract, there's a scope of work. I just listed a few items of interest. Um, there's quite a few details in the contracts that we give out, but overall they can't start working until we have a performance bond and the first installment, if not the whole payment. Um, the performance bond on each contract is based on acreage. It is returnable if they, uh, if we don't have any problems with what they're doing out there, if it's satisfactory. So if they have less than 20 acres in that one sale, the bond is $300, 20 to 50 acres, it would be 500, 
50 to 75, the bond is 750. If it went over that, then it's a thousand dollar bond if we had a hundred acre block. Um, again, they that's a separate check and uh, we do return that to them at the end of the contract. Uh, other things that are important for them to be aware of is the roads need to be cleared of all reasonable straw debris. They can't be blocking the roads with their, with their um, hauling units, you know, with their uh, box trucks that they're loading up with the bales. Uh, you know, they can't, uh, yeah, they need to make sure people can get, get around them. Uh, we issue a special use permit here on the forest, uh, allowing them to rake straw. Uh, that kind of helps us curb some theft that may occur on the forest. Uh, they have to display the special use permit. Um, we, we do require that these contractors have one person on site who speaks English, uh, or, or at least enough to be understood both in what we're asking and what they're responding with. And most importantly, all the pine trees in the sale area has to be protected against injury. Uh, we don't want them skinning them up, backing up into them, you know, just any kind of damage to our crop trees. Um, I just wanted to give you a couple of pictures to uh, give you an idea of kind of what they look like. This is a straw stand. It was raked probably a year ago, so there is straw on the ground. Uh, that pile that you see is the debris pile. The first thing that they do once they win the award is they usually send in a family, a husband, wife, a couple of kids, or maybe a couple of wives. They come in with um, usually those little kitty blue swimming pools and they drag them around collecting all the pine cones, all the sticks, all the, any debris of any significance. And they put them in a pile to get them out of the way. And those just sit there. We ask that they don't pile them up next to the base of the tree because if they caught on fire, it would be pretty hot. Uh, that's a 50-50 if they follow that or not, but we try to get them to do it away from the trees. Uh, this would be examples of straw raking equipment. Once the debris has been picked up, you'll have uh, people riding around on lawnmowers with, with a rake on the back. You'll have a hydraulic or pneumatic, I'm not sure which, uh, you know, where they can kind of maneuver it around and be bailing and raking all at the same time. Uh, got farm tractors that are out there doing the same thing. Uh, they usually do a pretty, pretty good job of not uh, messing up the stand. Uh, a lot of times uh, they are spending all their time raking the loose straw and they're putting it in piles. And this picture, you can see one pile is covered with a tarp because they don't want it to get wet until they're ready to bail. And in the background to the left, um, there are two other piles that have tarps on them that you can sort of see in the background. So uh, the condition of the stand has kind of a lot of understory competition in there, but it had a lot of good straw. So again, it's a very um, labor intensive operation and they were able to pull the straw out amongst all that vegetation. My guess is we're gonna to have to uh, burn it and take it out of production for a couple of years after this raking because um, it's just gonna get uh, more messy for lack of a better word for it. But, Lisa, um, Lisa, sorry to interrupt. If you can wrap it up so we can make sure and save time for questions, that would be great. So just wanted to show you that's what a baler looks like. This is a straw stand that has, they took that big pile and they bailed it up into bales. And then they'll run the truck down there and put them in the back to put them out at the box truck at the road. So income is uh, each stand is unique. The amount of money we generate uh, varies greatly from 20 to 350 an acre. We're not exactly sure why it varies so much, but it definitely has to do with quality, size of stands, uh, it might also be accessibility, the raking, the price war between contractors, and of course, the market. Um, over the last several years, our pine straw sales of 600 acres contribute more than 150,000 a year to our, to our annual budget. So it's a significant uh, fine for us. And there's a straw stand that's ready to be raked. And just look at the color on the ground. It's a color of money for us. Um, if you want more information or leaflets, pamphlets, a list of pine straw contractors that you could call and see if they're interested, uh, I believe you can find uh, that information at those two websites, both at the North Carolina Forest Service.gov and at Cooperative Extension Services at ncsu.edu.
Um, or you can also call your county ranger at the Forest Service, and they can certainly come out and look at your stand and give you some guidance on where, you know, how can you put it in production? That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, lots of great details there for people interested in pine straw for revenue. Uh, some of our questions, when raking straw, does the equipment show any detrimental effects on local flora? Overall, I would say no. Um, it does disturb it somewhat, but um, we currently do have a, a several straw studies with the Nature Conservancy here trying to see if actually raking it is doing more damage than if they lifted it, like with a pitchfork instead. And right now, I don't believe that research is uh, conclusive on if there is a benefit to lifting it instead of raking it. Okay, I have a couple of related questions. If you can speak to potential wildlife impact by removing the straw, and basically the, the, the second question, is there a way to manage the long leaf stand for both pine straw and wildlife? Probably, I mean, uh, pine straw stands, long leaf stands are, are actually have quite a, are a very strong ecosystem. They have a lot of diversity in them, um, whether it's, you know, the bugs and the reptiles and the um, squirrels and the deer. And uh, there's a lot going on in those stands, even though we're taking the straw every couple of years. Uh, I would say you're still, you can still be managing for the wildlife at the same time as trying to take that. I, I think they can be uh, managed together. It's not at one expense of the other. All right, someone's asking how much per acre? Well, that kind of depends uh, on the market and it also depends on the stand itself. Um, it, it can bring us anywhere from $20 an acre up to $350 an acre. And we haven't quite figured out what the rhyme or reason is to it. Like we don't know ahead of time that that one's gonna be a really good stand. Sometimes it surprises us. Uh, it's really up to the vendor what, you know, what if they want that stand because it's on the right side of the forest closest to his, you know, where he wants to take it to, he's going to pay more for it. So um, it, it still is pretty good. Even with minimal management, you can probably still get at least 80 to $100 an acre out of it if it's the right age. Okay, we're going to do one more question, and then we'll save the rest for the end of the webinar. What is the average bid on these lots? Uh, yeah, that's hard, hard to say. Um, uh, you know, just uh, it usually they bid a lump sum, but it, we break it down by acre just so that we're able to compare apples to apples. So again, it usually it varies a lot. It can be anywhere from 50 to $350 an acre. A lot of our stands, uh, they're raked every two years. And I would say more than not, we're getting 200 plus an acre. Okay, well, thank you very much, Lisa. We're out of time, so we will save the rest of your questions for the end. Um, that was very informative. And uh, our final speaker is gonna be Annie Baggett. She's from the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and she's gonna talk to us about agritourism. Good afternoon. Thank you all for, for joining us. I'm Annie Baggett, as Debbie mentioned, and I serve as an agribusiness developer and the agritourism marketing specialist with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. So today we're going to talk about agritourism and agritourism is an opportunity for farmers, especially landowners to diversify their revenue stream by welcoming visitors to the farm. And I'm not sure why I can't get this, there we go. We're advancing now. So our role at the Department of Agriculture is to position North Carolina as the go-to destination for visits on farms and connecting folks to local food across the world. So here's the formal definition of agritourism. So in short, it's a working farm 
that has the opportunity to welcome folks for educational, recreational, entertainment kind of opportunities. So in this photo here, um, this is a strawberry patch. So strawberries are, are a place where pick your own operations are very busy right now. So why? Why agritourism? And why, what's our perspective from the Department of Agriculture? So ultimately, to preserve the farmland, to inspire the next generation to farm. Um, the average farmer is 59 years plus. Um, to develop community vibrancy. So, you know, our farmland is oftentimes in the rural most parts of our state. So important to instill um, strong economies and also to increase the agribusiness's bottom line as well to, to make it, you know, possible, like Lisa was saying, make it possible to pay the taxes and perhaps support, um, for, support the farm family. So agribusiness is our state's top industry and it's really important that, that, that um, we be reminded of that. Um, 772,000 jobs. Um, number two is military and number three is tourism, kind of further down um, the kind of the income scale in terms of its contribution to the state. Um, so, you know, we're marrying two really strong industries in agritourism, so well supported. So it's also important for you to, to know that agritourism revenue has more than tripled between 02 and 2017. So the opportunities are there, and especially now in the midst of COVID, um, local food and outdoor experiences have never been more important to the public. So kind of more why, um, you know, the education of visitors, there was a study done by my counterparts over at NC State in extension research, um, just to talk about the benefits of agritourism. So um, you can see, you know, the education piece is really valuable. You know, what do you know? What do you have to share with guests? So be thinking about those things. Um, if you look down to the fifth item, it says generate additional income for landowners. So basically there was a survey that was done um, of farmers and then of uh, residents. And when farmers were asked, hey, yeah, you know, we need to make more money. Um, we need to diversify our revenue stream. You know, that really scored high for them. But when the residents were asked, when potential visitors were asked, you know, that didn't score very high for them. So, so as a marketing specialist, that's a concern. And what that means to us is that we really have to elevate the value of what it is that folks are going to be doing on our land and make sure that they're investing appropriately. So many people, especially now, you know, state parks, you know, lots of locations are free to visit, right? Um, and, and farms are not state parks, you know, farmers are um, assuming lots of responsibility and a lot of expenses, so they need to pay for that. So admission fees are important. So do you have an audience? So this is a historic view and a futuristic view of population um, growth in our state. So you can see the urban areas are growing. Um, most of our state is rural. So we are working to encourage folks um, to go out and explore um, the rural most parts of the state. So the home of, of UNC Chapel Hill is um, Orange County and Orange County is actually 70% rural. So that's always an eye opener for some folks. So it's important to look at trends and these are some pre-COVID travel trends, which you know I think still resonate today. So people are looking for experiences. Um, they're looking for things that provide them with comfort and happiness, especially now. Um, and many people just want to go places to feel like a kid again. And I don't know about y'all, um, but I spent a lot of time in the woods as a kid um, playing. And you know, to go back and enjoy that is a, a super opportunity.
So here are some more travel trends. So it's important that you just kind of look at them and think about what's important to you and what maybe would be a good fit, a good match for your, um, for your woodlands, for your forest. Um, these are things that, you know, were, um, Forbes Media did a, did a survey and these were things that people were looking for. So right now in the midst of the pandemic and just this week, this was presented, um, this data was presented through Visit NC and you know, where are people right now um, when it comes to travel experiences? So they are planning travel and they're planning it very carefully. Um, they're saying you know, they wanna be close to nature. So great, that's good news. They're visiting friends and relatives and that's not new. Um, that's the number one reason why people come to North Carolina as a visitor or a tourist. Um, enjoy outdoor recreation, getting off the beaten path. Though that is agritourism. So, you know, that is that just underscores what we're seeing in the industry today, um, which is that people are looking for outdoor experiences which are perceived, you know, safer. Um, so again, who are your customers? I want you to think about families. I want you to think especially about women. 85% um, of all family decisions are made or influenced by a woman. Now, my husband looked at me when I first told him that data and he said, is that all? So it's just really important to think about um, who your customer is and who you're talking to. And I am going through this very quickly so that we can cover a lot. So it's also about jobs. You know, there's a lot of revenue that's generated through agritourism, through tourism in general, but it's about maintaining jobs and it's about creating new jobs. So maybe there are new opportunities with these um, new ideas of revenue stream building for your, for your operation, for your forest. So when people come to North Carolina, what are they doing? What are they looking for right now? So what we have to do is really look at, is there a propensity for folks to go and visit a woodland or a forest? So the answer is absolutely yes. And um, there, this infographic was also um, provided by Visit NC Data um, folks. And you'll see, you know, there's rural sightseeing, agritourism activities actually made the infographic, which this is the first time that that's happened. 49 million individual people in 2019 came to North Carolina. There's enough market to go around. So is welcoming guests right for you? And why would you wanna do that? So my first question to you is, do you like people? Because what you're doing is you are taking the deep dive into a whole new industry. You know, you're moving um, where you're going to have a parallel business of agriculture and tourism. So how do you define success in agritourism? What does success mean to you? And it's going to be different for every single operator. So Janine mentioned this as well, that it's so important to have a business plan and a marketing plan. This is a business, agritourism is a business. And yes, landowners, farmers, agribusiness operators, oftentimes hold down you know, a full-time or a part-time job or someone within the farm family does just so they can get you know, health insurance or be able to you know, make ends meet as a, as a family. But again, it's a business. So it's important to have that planning and um, you know, pay attention to it um, you know, with, with good reporting and good kind of you know, revisiting your plans annually and setting goals, et cetera. So the things you need to think about, who's the face of the operation? Who's gonna be the storyteller? Who's going to be the educator? As you're learning more about the hospitality industry. So these are the key critical success factors when it comes to our tourism. And I will share with you that um, myself, along with others in the industry, came together and put together um, modules, seven modules 
that kind of go through all of the particulars that you need to know and understand when it comes to agritourism. So I encourage you to reach out to your cooperative extension agents, directors in your community and ask them about the agritourism curriculum. Oftentimes in the past, it's been a lunch and learn, it's been offered at community colleges, but it will, it will give you an opportunity to really dig in deeper and um, have the opportunity to, to leave with a framework of a business plan. So it's important for you to think about destination versus location. Doesn't matter if you're at the end of a country road or at the top of a mountain, if you have worthwhile activities, people want to come. It's important that you follow all the local rules and regulations and make sure that you're providing safe experiences for folks. Oftentimes when um, farmers are thinking about agritourism, there could be implications for the neighborhood. Um, so it's important that, you know, you reach out to folks that are, you know, along your property line and talk with them about what you're doing when it comes to bringing people um, to your to your land. You know, you're you're thinking about more traffic. Maybe there's dust from traffic. Um, they're parking, you know, that sort of thing. You can also work together. Um, so have like minded partners that can work together to to boost the community. Um, guests and visitors really want to do more than one activity. Um, they want to come, they want to visit and explore, take a tour, um, you know, a walking tour in your forest, but they also want to do something else and, they, and they, they're going to get hungry. Um, so they're going to want a local neat place to eat, other things to do. So our ultimate goal is to provide experiences of a lifetime to visitors, make them so unique that it's going to be something that they, they and their children are going to talk about um, around you know, their campfires for years to come. It's important that you think about your staff, having really well-trained, educated staff, um, think about how to set up your business so that there is profitability. Um, so that again goes back to the, the business plan and then also management of the realities of, of agribusiness or farming. So realities can be, you know, floods, hurricanes, wildfires, you know, you name it, we have it in North Carolina. So that the business management pieces that you need to think about are listed here. Um, I will just speak to the things that are most important to those in agritourism. Number one, safety and liability. And those are really kind of check off things. It's not hard. Um, and I can share resources with y'all when it comes to like liability insurance, making sure you've got, you know, hand washing stations, that sort of thing. The piece that's a little bit harder is the marketing and the PR piece. So, you know, it's truly the, you know, oftentimes growers and producers will say, I can grow you know, plants, I can raise livestock, but it's really hard to connect with customers. So it's important to think about how are you going to connect with customers? Are you going to pre-sell tickets? Um, do you have a website? Can folks hop on there and invest online? Um, whatever it is that you're offering. So those are pieces that are, are super important. You'll also see the warning here. This warning sign is a part of the agritourism statute. Um, and we ask that all agritourism operations post these at their entrance and at all of the activities that are um, happening on your property. These signs can be acquired by the North Carolina Agritourism Networking Association, and I will share that information with you shortly. Um, these are all the kind of opportunities, things that are happening across the state now, but truly, you are only limited by your creativity when it comes to what you offer on your property. It does boil down to storytelling. That is the most important piece. That's going to set you apart from anyone else. Um, I noticed in some of the questions that were answered about what, what makes your property unique, your forest or your woodland unique. And many, many said, wow, this has been in our family for multiple generations. And there are stories in there to tell and people are ready to hear them. 
So you have an opportunity to teach. You're the experts about the woodlands. You've got great stories. People are ready to listen. And you just need to turn that into a benefit. You know, why? Um, the reason why you're here is to learn about X. And here's what you're, you're going to leave with. So um, lots of exciting opportunities. So what benefits do your woodlands offer visitors? You know, what are you excited about? And what already exists on your property that you could turn into an opportunity to share and diversify that revenue stream. So education-based workshops is an easy thing. And when you teach, you're marketing. Marketing is education, education is marketing. And that is, that's like the universal rule. If you just remember that, if that's the only takeaway from this presentation today, um, do it, you know, that's it. Um, did you know that when people have food to eat, when they go to visit an agritourism location, that they stay longer and they spend more money? Maybe they spend more money in um, the retail shop or the farm store, or the farm stand. There are lots of opportunities um, to have fresh local food opportunities um, on, your, on your site. So you can imagine having overnight guests. So there was an article um, in the Charlotte Observer, July, 2019, that um, was done by Airbnb, measured that 40, 436,000 people stayed in Airbnbs in rural parts of North Carolina. And that added up to $76 million. That was a 74% uptick. Now, COVID, has created more of an opportunity. People have wanted to get out in um, rural places. So, you know, be it you have an opportunity to build cabins, cabins or cottages, um, have, an, have a bed and breakfast. You can do um, camping and glamping and all kinds of opportunities for people to stay on your property. You can create forest festivals. So celebrate your heritage get super creative on, on what folks could see and do and experience all while you're sharing your passions, you know, what you're most excited about. Um, I, I recently woke up in the middle of the night with, um, with an idea and jotted it down. And as I was getting ready to go back to bed, um, it was, I couldn't believe the lightning bugs. They were all really high in the trees because it was really late at night. And I was like, oh my gosh, that would be so fun for a family to experience. I have a cousin that is from the West Coast and they don't have lightning bugs where she lives. And she recently moved back to um, the East Coast. And that, when I asked her, I was like, what are you looking forward to most? She said the lightning bugs. So anyway, um, you can find all kinds of opportunities. So I mentioned this earlier, um, retail, um, you have an opportunity to sell direct to a customer and capture more of that bottom line, um, capture more of that consumer dollar um, by doing so. So I always imagine, you know, what you want to do is you want to take folks through a tour where they end up at the retail store. That is just seamless. It just makes sense for them to, you know, grab that strawberry ice cream cone, you know, after they've taken a tour of the, of the farm or participated in a UPIC. So lots of opportunities, um, you know, special events, um, lots of, there are lots and lots of, of weddings that have been hosted on farms. And that is coming back kind of as the mass gathering limits are expanded. Um, years and years ago, when I was way younger, I participated in a corporate ropes course up in the trees, and it was amazing. And I haven't, you know, I never had that opportunity again. It was somewhere in Chatham County um, that our group went, but um, there are lots of opportunities, whatever gets you excited, and all year long. Um, so even through the holidays, and this has been something that we have been working hard in the industry to help people understand that, you know, agritourism is not just pumpkin patches and hay rides in the fall. It is all year long. There's an opportunity. 
So what I've done here is I've just created just here's, you know, here's Annie just creatively thinking about, hey, if I had a forest, what would I want to do? Um, and not really knowing what your revenue stream looks like now, what I recommend is take a calendar and mark on it, you know, perhaps if folks are already raking, you know, pine straw in your longleaf pine forest, you know, you've got revenue coming in at those times, what are the times when you know, you really need to even out that revenue stream and have something happening, you know, every single month or when you want it. This is up to you. Um, but there's lots of opportunities. The first piece is that you want to go out into the community or survey your existing customers. Let them know what you're thinking about doing and listen to them because that is going to be truly the heartbeat of your business of your of your operation and that is key to marketing is that you've got to listen to your customers so i just sort of thought dreamed up some ideas here just to let you know some some opportunities there are a lot of 5k runs and walks that happen in agritourism creating some educational tours um you know have a fairy tour for the nursery, nursery schools. But you know what? Nursing homes would love it too. Um, you know, there was some questions about wildlife. You know, if you're excited about wildlife, you could do a spring tour. Um, you know, when the trees are starting to bud out, um, there's foraging, creating that retail space, you know, perhaps hosting weddings or celebrations of any kind. Um, you know, creating your own very unique opportunities based on what you're excited about. Um, so getting creative and really thinking about packages, you know, develop a full day package, coordinate with people in your community that are close to you, where you could put together maybe multiple stops. Um, maybe people only have a couple of hours to spend package that up for them, you know, let them know, oh, you can come for two hours, we'll do a 45 minute tour, and then you can picnic and do the self walking educational tour. And that is, you know, $25 for a group of four, or $25 per person, whatever value you place on it. So every Monday, I send out a Monday marketing message and some of you may have received it on Monday because I was promoting this webinar today. Um, but it's opportunities like webinars, you know, yes, um, grant funding opportunities, just tools and tactics in a very simplistic way um, to help you um, really promote your operation. We oftentimes have free media opportunities, so we'll ask you to complete a five question survey to let us know what's happening on your operation. And then we'll put together a media release that will go out to thousands of media contacts across the state. And lo and behold, you know, the media will reach out to you and do a story, ask to do, um, to capture video, that sort of thing. A program we're working on now that's expanding statewide is the Visit North Carolina Farms mobile app. I encourage you to download it now. It's live in 52 counties with 20 more coming on in the next few weeks. So we'll be about 75% across the state. We're promoting it now. Maybe you've seen some of these billboards out and about. Um, there's a multimedia promotional campaign that basically promotes destinations like farms and fisheries, pick your own operations, could be your forest. The Agritourism Networking Association is the group that I mentioned that offers those liability signs, um, nc.ana.org. It is a farmer driven all volunteer organization. There is an executive secretary that works part time for the group. It, it is an opportunity to learn, to network, to engage. Um, they host an annual conference and a couple of regional farm tours. There will be a regional farm tour this summer where you can learn about agritourism with other farmers. Um, and that's planned for the Columbus, um, Columbus County, um, Carteret County, kind of you might have to drive through Bladen County where Lisa is um, to, to get there. So you will find 
success and agritourism when you're excited about people, when you're excited about welcoming visitors, when you have a clear benefit, you know, why people want to come and you carve out that niche and figure out who your customers are. And truly, it doesn't matter if you are someone who is typically very quiet or someone that's very gregarious and knows the latest joke. Every single grower, producer, person that engages in agritourism as a host, there is a story to tell and um, there are fans to be, um, to be had. So we also just ask you to be inspired by other agribusinesses and other farmers. It's best for you to craft your own very unique opportunities versus trying to model after someone else. You know, maybe you, you go to an operation and you say, oh, wow, they're so successful. I'm going to try to do this too. It's really best to just kind of glean some ideas, make them your own, um, and create your own business plan and marketing plan around that. So together, we'll be the go-to destination for farm visits and um, connections to local food in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Annie. That was excellent. Um, very encouraging. And I think you've given everybody a lot of creative ideas to think about for their forests and farm. So we really appreciate that. Uh, we do have a few questions. Let's see, um, and reminder, if you have a question for Annie, please enter it in the Q&A. Um, okay. My husband and I enjoy visiting different harvest hosts. Is this something that the North Carolina Agritourism is promoting? So harvest host is, is a, um, it is an organization that a lot of agritourism destinations do promote, I mean, do participate in. We don't promote them. Um, we, I have considered, it's on my long list, of reaching out to like-minded partners like that um, to, to work with us with regard to the Visit North Carolina Farms app. Um, so they are a, um, you know, they're a profit driven organization. We're a state agency. So our role is to, um, to create programs and services that support our, our farmers and to make it no cost or low cost. Um, so, so Harvest Host is on our list and, and a lot of our, um, a lot of our destinations do use them. So, you know, like the Visit North Carolina Farms app, that's one tool in the marketing tool chest. Harvest Host can be another. There are many, like Airbnb is one as well. You had mentioned the agritourism curriculum. How long are each of the modules? I want to say that they're like one, they can be done in an hour and you may have like an hour's worth of homework. I think every single director, I know when I've presented um, for those, I, I did a couple at the community colleges and my sessions were an hour and a half. Um, so I think it just varies, but there's seven modules. So just imagine, you know, it would be like a day's worth of, of curriculum broken down and maybe an hour long lunch and learn. Okay, so this is your last question. So if anyone else has a question for Annie, please go ahead and enter it now. I'm doing hospitality retail and offer the farm as a venue for tours and events. At my concession stand, I'm considering serving alcohol in limited quantities during evening hours for adults only and weekends when families come out. Besides a license and letting my insurance agent know, are there other requirements I need to know? Yeah, um, just making sure that you that you pay attention to all of the you know rules and regs when it comes to alcohol. Many, um, especially our our agritourism destinations that perhaps host weddings, oftentimes they will hire off duty um, sheriffs, you know, to help manage um, the parking lot and make sure that no one is leaving intoxicated. Um, that sort of thing. So the, those are, you know, think about the health and safety of your guests. You know, what can you do to maximize um, that piece? Because 
you know, certainly you would not want any, you know, bad publicity. Um, I have one destination that, you know, basically they hire a bus um, because they're up at a, at the top of a mountain on a windy curvy road. And so they have everyone park in a satellite field where it's level and easy access. And they put everybody on a bus and drive them to their cars. And they have people, they have staff on that bus to monitor, um, just to you know, talk with people about, hey, do you have a designated driver? I think you really need one, or can I call you one? So think about those kinds of things when you're serving alcohol. We could talk a lot about that piece. <laughs> <laughs> Who do we contact about any restrictions on using our property for business open to the public and producing traffic? And what about zoning restrictions? So go to your local planning and zoning office and talk with them. Um, it is that is the that is your first step. Be proactive when it comes to um, local regulations. Um, and it's much, much better to go and present your ideas, talk with them about what's possible. You may want to talk with your local cooperative extension agent first um, based on, you know, what you're doing or your, you know, local director and just talk with them about what your opportunities are. And then together, you know, make your list of questions, put your presentation together for planning and zoning. Um, and you know, that, that is usually the, the very first step. You wanna make sure that you do that before you invest um, in any big thing. And I think, you know, my one, in addition to the marketing is education and education is, is marketing takeaway, the other takeaway that's really important to consider is that just start small. Just start with one small thing that is easy and seamless for you where you're not investing a lot. Um, and that will be what we'll call low hanging fruit um, and something that, you know, someone like planning and zoning would go, oh, yeah, that's not a problem. You know, if you want to host time ticketed small tours um, on your property, that's certainly permitted. You know, you are a bona fide farm. You're a working farm. Um, and that makes all the difference in the world. And who oh boy, I second this start small advice. I recommend that a lot as an extension agent to people. One more question, then we're going to save the rest for the uh, after uh, after hours after webinar session. Ticks and mosquitoes are really bad here. These can be a li liability. How do you deal with that challenge? Lots of chickens. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so you know, you just have to educate people when you come to the country. You know, there are. I mean, there's wildlife. Um, you know, I, I have seen lots and lots of pictures of, of snakes and chicken coops when, um, you know, folks were visiting and there's a story to tell their things to, to show. And, you know, when it comes to ticks and mosquitoes, I mean, we're not going to be able to do a whole lot unless, you know, you really want to pull out all the chemicals. We do ask that, um, it's easier to kind of you know, limit the amount of land that folks are traversing, right? Um, and talk with them ahead of time, you know, just say, hey, here's what you can expect. There's, you know, you need to wear closed toed shoes. You know, there are socks that have, you know, you can get hiking socks that have these inserts or, or things on them that can deter ticks from crawling up your legs. You know, you may want to make sure you bring your bug spray. Um, you know, whatever the things are, you need to be upfront about that. You're coming to the country. That is a reality. That is a reality. And that is our job. We are on the front end of, um, of providing folks with an opportunity to engage in nature. And that's a part of it. And, you know, if you are someone that, I mean, we talk about this all the time, like, you know, you have to have people in the parking lot helping people park on a field, on a pasture, because those folks have only parked on asphalt. They've never parked in a pasture. So they don't have any lines and they end up parking sideways and take up a lot of room. So you've got to have people out there. The same is true when it comes to things like ticks and mosquitoes. Just let them know what to expect and provide them with guides. We have a whole host of, you know, from 
from all natural to, you know, the heavy duty off on our property. If people come to visit, they can, they can use what they, what they want, you know, and just be out of range of other guests. If, um, make sure they don't, they don't spray their neighbor. All right. Thank you, Annie. And, uh, I think we had three excellent speakers today. Um, and I'm looking forward to the additional bonus uh, Q&A session. I hope some of y'all can stick around. We want to remind y'all that we have two more webinars in our Protecting Your Wood series. The next one will be June 10th on forest certification and cost share programs. And then July 8th, we'll be talking about property taxes and estate planning. So we also want to remind you, oh my goodness, and my PowerPoint's not advancing again. <laughs> we, uh, we do have some mugs for sale. Um, give me a second and I will be glad to tell you about them. Um, and I have information on, um, excuse me, I can't talk apparently and do this at the same time. Um, oh boy, give me a second. Yeah, I really can't, can't talk and do this at the same time. So we're going to give you information on how to order our, our wonderful Forest Herd travel mugs. There's some information there. And um, if you need, if, if this goes by too quickly and you need it again, just contact one of us. But people are really enjoying these. So everybody needs one, right? Um, we also, oh my gosh, here we go again. <laughs> Technical difficulties, I'm sorry. I want to um, gotta stop sharing again. Good thing this is at the end of the webinar, right? Um, hold on. Uh, while I'm getting this back up, um, Bob is, has shared in the uh, chat the link that we really hope y'all will um, take, take some time to do the follow-up survey that really helps us plan future webinars. It'll just take a few minutes. We, we'd love to connect more with you. Uh, we have a, a great Facebook group that we'd love for you to join. Just look for Forest Her NC. It's a group. Um, and we also have an educational uh, page, too, uh, for Forest Her. We're on Instagram at hashtag Forest Her NC. And then if you want to make sure and get on our email list, there's the email address. And we hope to very soon have a website. Um, so that's really about all I have. Um, Please stay on the Zoom with us if you want to ask additional questions and we'll make sure and tackle uh, those questions that did, we didn't quite have enough time for. We really appreciate y'all uh, joining us today. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about y'all, but I had a great time. Looking forward to watching the recording again. Uh, Bob or Deanna, did y'all wanna add anything to wrap this up? I think uh, just that the uh, recording. Go ahead, Deanna. I was just saying, I think she had it covered, but you go ahead, Bob. You had something. I'll paste the link into uh, the Forest Her uh, NC YouTube channel. So you'll be able to view this uh, webinar uh, probably within the next couple of weeks. The recording will be up and available for people to, to view. Just copy that link and that will take you to the YouTube channel. And many thanks again to Janine and Lisa and Annie for being our speakers. So um, we hope some of you can stick around. Uh, I think we are ready to um, start looking at the additional questions. Oh, okay. Um, I'm gonna go to the uh, Q&A. Um, Deanna, I think you might need to get someone else to do that. <laughs> I can't do that and do the questions at the same time, maybe. Um, I guess I'll just start at the top with the questions, if that, unless anybody has a better idea. These are the questions that we didn't quite get to yet. Um, so here's one. Can income generated from agritourism be used to establish present use value for, for property tax purposes if there's no other agricultural income? And this, this person offers a bed and, graphic, bed and breakfast experience through Airbnb with their barn apartment. Really good question. So you'll need to go to your local tax office and go through the application process. But certainly present use value is all about land. It's all about land ownership and how you're working your land. 
So, um, but it, you know, it doesn't hurt to get that conversation going and started, but started within your community. I think it's important that you reach out, you know, to folks like, you know, um, like Cooperative Extension, um, you know, how much land do you have? Um, what are you doing with it? How are you operating it? Um, how are you gaining income um, from it? And yes, you can include that agritourism piece, but, you know, from the, from the local tax, um, tax office PUV piece, and I am not an expert at that, um, but, you know, there's agricultural use, horticultural use, and there are very specific rules and regulations um, centered around that. There's also the, the forestry piece, you know, are you, are you working your, um, your woodlands as well? So um, I think digging into that with more specifics with your local tax office and with your folks that um, can help you with the agriculture land use piece will be the, uh, the best next step. Okay, thank you, Annie. Um, I think this question is for Lisa. What would cause someone to lose their performance bond or part of the bond? Well, um, I would say probably the number one thing that we're always leery of is they tend to want to uh, make little fires to cook or to warm with on these cold mornings. And if they're not paying attention, it could get away from them. So they would lose their performance bond for that. Uh, or if they decided to just start burning those debris piles with the cones and stuff, that's not allowed. So that would be a problem. Uh, if they did extensive damage to any of the crop trees, uh, you know, skinning them up or pretty much, you know, doing damage to the bark, that would be a problem. Um, and also on occasion, we have people who they make that first installment they do some raking and then they disappear and they never make the second installment. So we would obviously be able to at least retain the performance bond for that. All right, also for Lisa, what time of year do you recommend prescribed burns? I would recommend that you do it during the winter months. That way the trees are kind of in a dormant um, condition. And that way uh, the temperature is cooler so that if you have a lot of roots in the duff layer, hopefully the fire won't get so hot that it um, stresses out your trees. So I would definitely do it during the winter months to start with. Further down the line, if you wanted to move to a growing season burn, you could, but you need to keep in mind that what that's doing is it's uh, kind of uh, stimulating seed development and, and whatnot. So if you want more wire grass, then you would want to do that. But if you don't want, other things and that's not the time to burn. Shoot for winter. All right, so now we have someone who's trying to get information on sourcing mechanical balers because they have a severe labor shortage. Um, she has long leaf that they planted in the CRP that's now expired and ready to sell and needs help. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know where you would buy those. My only comment would be that um, the people who are doing the bailing, they generally are making a dollar a bail. So it's a lot of hard work if that person is thinking they're gonna be doing it and then trying to sell the straw. Um, I, uh, I think I saw that in the uh, question and answer and I believe they have uh, 50 acres or so. And I just, I looked real quick to see, we sell stands that are smaller than 50 acres. And in March of 2020, uh, we had a 28 acre stand that we sold for $305 an acre. Nine acre stand was $138 an acre. An eight and a half acre stand was $304 uh, an acre. 33 acres would be $85 an acre. So um, I really would be surprised if they can't find a contractor who would come in and take care of that for them. But as far as uh, knowing where to get a baler, all I can say is on the Forest Service website, we have a leaflet on how to build your own, which would be similar to the one that was in my presentation. Um, otherwise, I'm not really sure where you would go for that. I'm sorry. All right, so I would ask if any of the other uh, Forest Turf folks on, the, uh, on this Zoom, if they have any tips, um, if you could type that in the chat, that would be great. Thank you. Does raking pine straw reduce the nutrient base to the soil? It would because, you know, obviously the straw would be decomposing and putting nutrients back into the soil. 
But the fact, the truth of the matter is longleaf tends to be on um, very droughty, nutrient poor sites to start with. So I think the main nutrient that you have to worry about is loss of soil moisture. That seems to be what stresses out the trees more than nutrient loss. So anything you can do to preserve the soil moisture is probably your best bet. I wouldn't rake every year. When you have people coming in, if you can have them leave the gray straw, uh, that would help to preserve the mulch layer to keep the soil moisture there. They really only want the uh, red straw to start with, but you would need to ask them to try to preserve that mulch layer. All right, thank you, Lisa. Okay, here you go, Annie, one for you again. Could you share the slide with your ideas for farm activities again? This is the slide that started with barnyard animals. Oh, sure. Okay, let's see if we can get there. Do you want me to move on to the next question while you're doing that, or do you want to say anything about it? Maybe the person um, can take a picture of the slide with their phone. <laughs> That's what I do. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'll, um, I'll go ahead and keep going and while you're doing Yeah, keep that. going. Keep going while I do that. Okay. Um, and if you need to say anything about it, um, before I forget, though, we have a randomly drawn two participants' names to receive a, a, a Forest Her Travel mug. So I'm going to announce your names. I hope you're still here. Um, Elizabeth Waters and Mary Plummer. Tell them what they win. They win a new Forest Her Travel mug. <laughs> and um, Deanna Nobles will contact you by email to arrange you know, for you to get those. Okay. Okay, next question. Can it, this is another Annie question. Can income generated from, oh, we already did that one, I'm sorry. <laughs> we did the present use value one, I must've forgot to type it. Okay. Our local nonprofit food pantry in Jones County is planning a fundraiser in October where we're inviting the public to visit seven different sites that include a tree farm, two small retail businesses, music does this qualify as agritourism and the agritourism liability waiver so it's very important to understand that the waiver the warning the agritourism liability statute does not replace insurance you must have coverage for that kind of an event um, to me, the liability warning is more of kind of a, a raise the public awareness piece that, you know, it, it, it was written out of legislation or a warning that was created for equines, for horses, for people that ride horses in our state. So pretty much before the agritourism statute came about, the statute was, hey, if you ride a horse in our state on someone else's property, and you get hurt or you die, um, that's your thing. You know, you chose to do that and you know, we are not gonna be liable for that. So it's very strong language in that the liability says you could get injured or you could die. Um, and so when you have that posted at say, you know, a place where you're welcoming people for a tour and they look over and they read it or it's in your, um, information that you're sending out to your guests before they arrive at your at your place, it elevates that awareness and, and lets them know, oh, you know, farms are one of the most dangerous places that we can visit, that we can go. So it's important that they understand that. But again, it is not a replacement for insurance. So all of those sites need to get, everyone needs to have layers of insurance and everyone needs to um, make sure that there's that, that overriding event insurance, then everyone needs to be kind of a co-collaborator on that. So whoever's taken the lead needs to talk with their insurance provider, let them know what's happening, how it's working, what the risks are, and figure out how to gain that coverage. Now, the good news is that you can get single day or, or a couple of day event insurance that's quite affordable. Um, 
You just need to make sure that you've got the right coverage for the activities. So I'm glad that you brought that question up and can be proactive about that moving forward. All right, thank you, Annie. Are there cost share opportunities to facilitate a transition to agribusiness? Um, are there cost share opportunities? So that, so is there any money? So, um, so there are, are cost share grant opportunities that open up frequently. Um, and, you know, especially in light of, of COVID support, um, you know, we've shared lots and lots of opportunities and mostly through the Monday marketing message, but like Ag, Ag, Ag Ventures, you know, does, you know, grants for building structures or for physical kind of things. There's all kinds of grant opportunities that happen. You just need to know, you know, when they're open, um, you need to make sure that, you know, you've got that information so that you can apply. Um, I can send, I do have just a, a kind of a short list of resources that includes some of the, the grantors, um, but it's important to just get on all of the listservs, get on the, the Monday marketing list, you know, make sure you're on Debbie's list. She's got an invaluable list. She's so helpful when it comes to supporting the small farm community. Um, I think that's, that's really what what you need to do in order to kind of, you know, um, open up the opportunities for you to, to gain some cost shares or grant funding. Thank you, Annie. Um, so I've got one more kind of comment that I'm gonna turn into a question. Um, but meanwhile, we've still got some time. So if any of y'all have any more questions for the speakers or just general forestry questions. We got a lot of experts here. Please go ahead and type them into the uh, Q&A box. So Lisa, this is a kind of a comment that I'm gonna turn into a question for you. Um, in talking about income, you know, from um, pine straw, I know you, I remember you had mentioned you had different size tracks in your forest, as small as three acres, but I guess at, at what point, at what, what is the minimum acreage where you think this would be a profitable venture for a landowner? You know, like it's under 50 acres. Is this going to be something that someone should look into as an income stream if they have less than 50 acres of, of pine? My thought would be yes. Um, if you have a longleaf pine stand, which I know, uh, you know, over the last 20 years, CRP has been very active in taking mar marginal farmlands and converting them into longleaf stands. And once that contract is over, you can rake straw there. So uh, I would say that it would be lucrative to me if I can make even $100 an acre every other year on my trees that are just growing for timber. I, I think that's a, why not? You know, whether that's, uh, you know, on a 10 acre track or if it's on a 30 acre track. Uh, I believe that there are people out there who will rake it. Now, if you're the only uh, farm, you know, in a, I don't know how far of a radius, you have to kind of be where the uh, straw raker is going to be to start with. So that he's kind of moving around the area uh, to be able to collect it from individual owners. So that, you know, not knowing uh, what else is in the area, that might be a hard call um, for the tree, for the um, straw raker to move on a track. I really have no idea what their minimum interest would be. Uh, I'd be happy to give a couple of phone numbers to, to the person and they'd be welcome to call them up and see if they work in their area and if they would come for a 50 acre track. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, what is the space? This is also, we just got a brand new question <laughs> for you, Lisa. What is the spacing on your long leaves? What would be needed for a sustainable loblolly stand? Uh, well, typically on a loblolly stand, it would be planted depending on, you know, which uh, decade you're talking about. But uh, right now we're planting our long leaf or our loblolly on uh, seven by 10 foot spacing per acre. Uh, our long leaf, we're doing eight by 10 or maybe 10 by 10 
feet. 10 by 10 feet by 10 feet would be the spacing. Okay, so thank not, you. Yeah. Okay. So I don't see any more questions, and we've still got a little time. Um, do any of our Forest Her committee members on the Zoom have a question <laughs> or a comment or an announcement that they would like to make to everyone here? If you want to come off mute or put it in the chat, either way, still got time for more questions from participants as well. Bob, it's awfully quiet out there. Should we just wrap it up early? You can. Uh, if the audience doesn't have any more quad, you have a question that is coming. Oh, I was getting ready to sing a song. Oh my gosh, y'all were <laughs> saved. My gosh. Okay, my property is in the foothills and the soil will not support longleaf pines. Do you know of any successful loblolly plantations where they're raking every two years? I, I, uh, I do not. I know that uh, the further west you go, they do use loblolly, but I'm not familiar with specifics on that at all. They might be able to call the county ranger with the Forest Service and see if they can get some more information on that. Okay, I see we're not going to end early because questions are coming in. Um, so someone's asking, how do we become a Forest Her member? Uh, I would say definitely just email that email address so someone can type it in the chat again and we will get you on our list. Anything to add to that, Bob? Uh, no, I, uh, Deanna probably has more insight on that than I do, so. So when you register, we put you on the on the Forest Hair list, sir. So that means you're already a member, yay. <laughs> okay, um, so, to prepare, here's another question. To prepare for the cost share program in June, please start making your dream list of what you want to do on your property. Then we can look to see if there are funding opportunities. Start dreaming. So I get that wasn't so much a question, but a, a, a challenge, <laughs> uh, a, a mandate. That's a good, good suggestion. Um, hey, Debbie. Yes, Jennifer. Hey, hey, this is Jennifer. Um, I just wanted to comment uh, about the question about using loblolly pine for pine straw. Um, of course, do. Lisa is Lisa is more well versed because she's in Longleaf Country and, and is doing that. Um, but I'm more in the Piedmont, and we've not really had uh, a lot of folks look into raking loblolly straw. But there are some success stories out there with doing that. Uh, the difference is uh, folks that are using that is loblolly pine straw does not stay around as long as longleaf does. And so people are typically not paying a, a larger price. You're typically not getting the prices that you would for longleaf straw just because longleaf is more preferred. Um, but there's a, a very few, there are some successes out there, but um, I think they probably have a, a direct vendor that they've been working with and have found that niche market locally to actually be able to sell that uh, locally and, and pretty directly. Great, thanks. Great That's to hear comment. from you, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, someone has asked in the chat about missing the past meetings and absolutely all the recordings are on the Forest Her YouTube channel. If I can ask one of my fellow committee members to post that link in the chat. Um, cause you can, that's, what's great about these webinars. You can go back and watch all of them. I love that. Um, here's a question for you, Janine. What is used for watering the botanicals in the forest? Just natural rainfall or is it water brought in or wells dug? It can be done several ways. Um, most of the time people don't bring irrigation in. Uh, for the botanicals, because the botanicals, if they're set in a site with good moisture to get themselves established, if we get into a drought situation, those plants will usually just go dormant early. But mushroom growers in the woods will often set up irrigation systems and work off gravity feed off of their um, streams if they're in the mountains or the foothill regions 
or they will bring in small pumps and they will do micro um, sprinkler type irrigation. Great, thank you. Anybody have anything else? Bob has posted the link to the evaluation. Okay, not seeing any more questions at the time. I thought this was a really fun webinar. We want to thank all of our speakers again and um, thank all of you for coming and thank all of the Forest Her committee members that made this possible. And we really hope to see y'all at the next webinar on June 10th. You should all be getting emails about it now that you're in our group, you're an official member. Um, I don't have anything else to add. It's just I want everybody to enjoy the spring and stay safe. And we'll be sending out information on the recordings as soon as that's available. Anybody else want to add anything? I actually have another question. This is Jennifer. <laughs> Go ahead, Jennifer. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this is for Janine, uh, if she's still on. Um, I just had a, a question about the black cohosh. Um, I, I noticed that we're picking up several stands that have that in it in Orange County. And I guess I'm just not as familiar with that. And uh, what is the, the use of that? What, what, are, what are folks mostly using that for? The primary use for black cohosh is as a natural um, replacement for hormone replacement therapy for non-desirable menopausal symptoms. <laughs> okay. It seems to work pretty well for a lot of women. That is the primary use for it. Okay, thank you. That's, mm -hmm. that's great. Janine, there's one question in the chat. They were wondering what was the species of trillium you mentioned? One second. I am doing a can't remember at the moment, but I've got my book right here. And that's going to primary be primarily be the trillium erectum. Okay, remind, thanks, Janine. Remind us of that book, Janine. <laughs> so <laughs> the book is Growing and Marketing, Ginseng, Golden Seal and Other Woodland Medicinals by myself and Scott Persons. And Scott is a North Carolina resident who really is responsible for commercializing the wild simulated system that so many forest farmers now use. And did we already post a link to where to find that? Is that pretty easy to find the book? Very, very easy to find. Um, you know, you can order it off Amazon, a lot of places like Southern Exposure, Seed Exchange, and United Plant Savers carry it, or you can buy it directly from me and I'll sign it for you. Will you post the, the title one more time in the chat? It, it may have already been done. I don't remember, but I will do it right now. Thanks. Okay. All right. We managed to go all the way almost to three o'clock. Okay, going once, going twice. <laughs> Don't forget to do your evaluation. There's the title, Growing and Marketing Ginseng, Golden Seal and Other Woodland Medicinals. Excellent resource. Thanks again to all of our speakers. That was wonderful. <laughs>